<laughs> Hi everybody, thank you for coming out on a beautiful Saturday. We welcome you to relax and enjoy the beauty that is here in front of you as well as outside. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I wanted to start off by saying thank you so much to the 20 Summers crew who have been really wonderful and helpful to us since we got here, including Alice, Cecilia, Mike, Pablo, and Aziz. Um, I also wanted to start with a quick land, sorry, with a quick land acknowledgement and just honor that we are on the ancestral land of the Nelset people who are the original stewards of this territory. Um, I am Jenna Wortham, I also go by Jay, and I am a journalist, podcaster, and an author. Um, for my day job, I work at the New York Times, and I'm a reporter there, and I also make a podcast called Still Processing. And in 2019, I'm like, what are years anymore? I think it was 2019, um, an anthology that I published with Kimberly Drew came out called Black Futures. And right now I'm working on a nonfiction book called Work of Body. And I was lucky enough to be here two summers ago to work on it. And now I'm here in conversation with my friend, Devin and Morris, who I will let introduce himself. Hi, um, my name is Devin and Morris. Um, <laughs> I'm an artist, I'm not practice. I'm an artist and yeah. That's like a big state now, so I think you can get to it later. <laughs> but um, I'm from Baltimore. I, I lived in New York for the last 10 years, um, and now I'm kind of like doing like a nomadic journey of placelessness until September, where I have to decide a home again. Um, I think that's very important for what we're talking about today, because like everything I'm interested in is about place and like memory and what we mm -hmm. derive from it and what's left behind and what becomes trash and you know, what that speaks to as far as like an archive of our work. So, yeah. Well, there you go. Thank you to 20 Summers and everyone who's there facilitated um, today. Kind of. Yes. So, um, to start, Devin is going to walk us through a bit about his practice and kind of leading us up to where we are today. And then we'll have a conversation. And if there are questions you want to ask, we can leave some time for that as well. And also be mindful we started a bit late in case people have. And I just wanted to say that we are drinking lilac water, <laughs> which was made with lilacs from this land. And it's a very easy thing to do. Um, just make sure your lilacs are in bloom, just like the ones right here. They have not been sprayed. You cut them at the stem, rinse them, and just put them in a bottle, or sorry, a, a container with, or a bottle with filtered water, and just leave it overnight. And what you'll be left with is this very floral, fragrant beverage that is so delightful for hot days like this. And you can reuse um, the blooms a couple of times. You'll know when they're kind of running out of juice. But I don't know. How would you describe the beverage? Um, light, fragrant, and surprising. Yeah, it's a very surprising. <laughs> part. Yeah, no, I would drink that scent. So. Yeah, yeah, you are. Yeah. yeah, it feels good. So just a little tip from... <laughs> so, okay. Devin. Hey. Okay. So to start, I want to um, show this walkthrough of my last exhibition at Delhi Gallery in Tribeca, Manhattan. Um, I feel like this will give us a good general, um, and we can start the conversation. I'll just have some of the uh, more words that I've made over the years playing in the background. Um, I don't think you can like it if I read. Yes. Yeah. The way I work or what I've done, but yeah. this is a good start. That's too many. And um, the audio, it was a part of this sculpture in the center that I kind of considered like a formative sculpture where it was um, activated by guests grabbing a doorknob in the middle of the sculpture. It's like two hallways. And you'll see it in the video, but the audio is what would play for two minutes if you held the doorknob. Hold on. 
full milk, long if the can can hold on. If you can hold on. If you can if you can longer if you can hold on hold on. If you can hold on longer. Hold on if you can. Longer if you can. Hold on. If you can. I'll just play these in the background. Um, a little bit more about myself and my practice. Uh, I would think of collage as a means of living, like as a way of being, whereas you utilize what you have to make what you need. Um, I think in a very similar way books are made and, um, and it kind of speaks to the need to like maintain a practice of living and like taking care of what you have. Um, I also see collage as, as a means organizing thoughts, space, places that we live in as we are just kind of piecing together objects to make um, these houses, to make a floor, to take a piece of wood and then hone it down, to tree it and hone it down to a floor. So I'm like always like kind of looking long, like <laughs> I'm always like gazing and like thinking about how or why and I pull in from the environments that I go to objects to work with. Um, that's like the first part of my practice is like being, I call it a, um, a predator. And, and I think photographers are predators. Mm -hmm. And it's okay. But, um, but so I'm always like re-navigating what um, a concern could be for our practice and like bringing them to how I think. So like uh, the predator, me being like the photographer of like a neighborhood I'm walking around, I'm like, what's vulnerable? what has been taken out of its domesticity, and then allowed to be put in nature, which is like uprooting it from its um, safe place of like being rooted under a roof. Um, so like here, across from the home I'm staying in, uh, I found a window and like a whole lot full of things that have been like just taken down. And so that's like the first process I start with my, with my art. Um, and I think it's like the most important part because not everything always ends as a two-dimensional, three-dimensional work. It typically, like it might become a fair uh, mm -hmm. for, for sharing other people's work. It might become a uh, performance. It could be, become an environment for an image. And then I look at that as like another way of like making a collage and then like making it forever by photographing it. So, um, yes. Yeah, memory archiving care legacy mm -hmm. also like trying to somehow um emote this uh the feelings of like ephemerality around so many different loose things like me creating this very ambitious um sculpture to house this audio t um, text piece uh is oftentimes like what i'm trying to do like you know even when i'm thinking about like um figurative bodies within the work like how can i get to this um feeling of transcendence and or the ephemerality of just memory like what i liked about being raised by the women i was raised by i pretty much liked all of it i didn't dislike any of it but mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah that was hey beautiful. Jenna. Hey Jay. <laughs> Wait, I just want to say that video because I missed that Deli yeah, missed show. That show. So Del and I, 
Dylan. Devin and I have been friends for a long time and I've seen your work evolve and yes. shift. I've been to many of your openings and that's the one I missed. No. That video was incredible. Is anybody else having a response to it? It was so amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that I, was that was interesting, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. I'd love to hear you talk more about it if you feel comfortable. If something's coming up. I'm always crying. But anyway. Me too. I, like my eyes are full of tears yeah, right I'm now. I'm like always crying. Yeah. Um, but like I was thinking about so many like deaths. Yeah. I was like, I was like oh. And not like COVID death, but like post-COVID um, dealing with COVID. Right. I'm always mourning. I'm always, like, you know, I've I dealt with a lot of death in my life. Um, and so post-COVID, I just saw so much, like, suicide. Yeah. And it just, like, really bothered me. But I also think that everything that happens is, like, t t like really okay and, like, it's supposed to happen. So, like, I'm not God. I don't feel that way. I don't feel like you should be here. Like, whenever somebody goes, when they're supposed to go, like, mm -hmm. who am I? Um, even those who we care the most for, they have not, their lives have nothing to do with our lives. We are just in benefit that we have any moments with each other, like even right now. Mm. Um, so I've settled that through death and through mourning. And I think that's a great learning through it. And, uh, but around COVID it was, it was challenging. Like the, uh, amount of people in my family who were, who maybe attempted suicide or just spoke about being depressed and like wanting to attend, like, you know, telling, like just telling uh, my family, telling all of us, sharing with each other that we felt these ways. And I was like sitting in my studio and I just like drew this like really weird, <laughs> fast drawing to text my gallery and like, hey, I want to make this chamber. And he was like, okay, we'll do it. Mm -hmm. You know, like no matter what, um, just send me a better drawing. And I created that, you know, like I just created this text because it, it just played in my head. And um, it felt, you know, great to be supported through such a simple, um, very sensitive thing that was mm -hmm. like housed in something that housed like this domesticity that I was interested in. Um, and I'm not always selfish with my work, but with that specific work, I was being very selfish. I just wanted my nieces and nephews to come. And experience that and experience the work. And just experience it. And they did. So, yeah, like the video, though, you know, like shows the larger works that were made. I feel like I made my first sculptures within this work, even though I made sculpture before, or work, the work might feel sculptural as sometimes things come directly off the canvas um, or like act in ways that feel more uh, useful to life. Like I made a piece last year that was like, it could sit and kind of stand on its own on a wall, mm -hmm. and look like a dresser in a way. Mm -hmm. um, but with this show, I felt like this was my first time, like taking a step toward sculpture, mm -hmm. taking a step toward um, more, I wouldn't call it abstract, but like more um, conceptual and like more conceptual ideas that take less, that's like, when you think about painting, it's like the stroke, right? So some of the greatest paintings, um, are like the, those paintings that literally seemingly are two sh colors, right? And But it takes probably way more than one stroke, but the effect is of a stroke, just one pass. And some of the great artists have figured out ways to do this in one pass. Um, so I've been thinking more about like how to make things that, that, that do less, but say a lot. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and I'm nowhere near that I'm still saying a lot and using all these colors and like make you know I'm like I don't feel like that's my honest truth I'm a poet so I want to tell more poetry say more poetry I want to be more honest yeah you really are a poet and you are a natural writer and I kind of came into knowing your writing before your visual art practice mm -hmm. so I always I can't help but see the the two in tandem and even the titles of your works are always these kind of haikus or not a haiku because that's a specific form but mm -hmm. they themselves are fragments of a poem Definitely. always you're always doing world building and world creating and I, I just want to say also I know a lot came up and so thank you so much for just being willing to share that and just kind of sit with the feelings and in this room. And I feel like that's something I'm also sitting with because we're in this moment of 
our outside lives look quite normal and we feel like we're returning back to some sort of attempt at whatever was before, even though we all know that that doesn't quite make sense. But it also feels important to just, you know, when feelings come up, not suppress them because there was that article in the Times that was like, well, we're going to grieve for a year. The, the, you know, the t- amount of appropriate amount of time for grieving is one year after that it becomes excessive or whatever it was mm-hmm. in the DSM, which was just so foolish. And like, I just, I'm glad we all agree that that was foolish, but just to sort of acknowledge that um, we're still moving through feelings and and places and spaces and and moments bring up we we were still we're still going through such a traumatic time and so i really appreciate you just letting us move with that and i i feel that way all the two now i cry all the time now and i used to be a i i would never let i'm such a scorpio i'm like no one's gonna see me cry and i was in Times square the other day for the first time in like nine months and i was just crying and i was with a good friend of mine and he was like are you okay and i was like i just i feel emotional and i'm just gonna let it out like mm-hmm. nothing's wrong but and this to me feels very healthy. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. Thank you. I think it is too. Mm-hmm. I think it's so healthy to just emote whatever the feeling is. And I think it's violent when we don't allow others to emote. Like, you know, and, but, you know, we also have to be conscious of what we're doing. So, like, mm-hmm. if you're emoting anger, you got to think about it. But, um, right, right. But, but sometimes you want to emote some anger. So get it out and cry. Um, I don't think some people will have a long enough time in their life to mourn what they're mourning, whatever it is. They might die. And um, as they've been mourning something, I've mourned the death of my dad for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And it finally feels like something I can, like, let go. Mm. And you never let go. It's always there. But I don't think of him in the way that it used to break me, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was definitely 10 years where it was nothing, you know. It was no mourning. There was just autopilot. And I think that's what most people are doing right now. I agree. I agree. As I was thinking, there there are certain conditions required to be able to feel. Mm -hmm. There are certain conditions required to be able to grieve, to be able to mourn. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're not the same for every person. And it takes so long to even figure out what that means for an individual, you know? So, yeah, just holding that. But, you know, the images that, well, well, the images that we're looking at right now, like that, that was one. Are these all from the Delhi show? No, these are like from, this is about 2017 through now. Oh, okay. So this is like the most recent, like in 2020, 20, I mean, 2022, 2022. I made those in Brazil. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. my God. And that's the piece that feels like a dresser to me, at least. But it can kind of sit on the floor by itself. And I can like go slower if anybody wanted to talk about any one of these specifically. This is just like some smaller works I did of the house and not. That's your house. Anymore. Yeah. yeah, I love that one so much. Oh my gosh, this is my first time figuring out how to put a um, a uh, monotype. So monotype is basically like you make a painting on some kind of surface, and then you you send it through you you make the painting backwards. Then you put paper on top, send it through a press, and then it comes out the direction you want it. Um, so I made a huge monotype, two of them here. Uh, these t- is four sheets of paper, um, and that's what I made the bodies out of. So like the t- bottom two is one sheet, and then you see, if you got close, there's like the offset is off, and that's because the top two are part of a different sheet. And then this weird <laughs> outdoor um, street lamp was a different monotype and Hmm. and these colors are monotype everything else is painting collage suspension like things are happening and something like it's so funny how ambitious a work like this is because it's only suspended because i could i could never afford to frame it um so it's like (laughs) i had to figure out Hmm. ways to like successfully show and that's been a huge thing like how to successfully be like kind of like outside of the framework of just stretching a canvas and like, but how to present it well for for one, um, for it to be archival mm-hmm. and for it to be like, you know, pleasurable for the eye as well. But this work to me felt like a breakthrough. And I did this at home when I was in between studios for one really? month last year. And this oh is when gosh. Max came and I got represented by, by a gallery. <laughs> I mean, I do want to talk about what's in your paintings and your, I, I don't know if it's right to call them paintings, but the, the works of art, the yes. works. Because there are always these scenes of domesticity, but they're also on earth, but not on earth. I mean, this, there's always a door. There's always a portal. There's always a window. Oh, yeah. This person's standing on a door. Mm-hmm. 
And I just, I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about the worlds that you're building because there's always a lot happening and being lucky enough to know you, I can always kind of spot like where you're living at the time or what's happening. Um, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. I would love to share. I mean, I'll be honest with this. I'm not often honest about my work. <laughs> and, I think, <laughs> and I think smart artists should never be honest because who feels like having to talk about what's really going on? Um, <laughs> this person doesn't hear it. I agree. Like I, say it. I was just like, whatever. But um, also, people don't even care. But uh, so, like, I, I did a few things here. Um, the person who I'm hugging, we were like dating. This, the people normally aren't like real in a way. They have real bodies, they're real people. But, and I, th I understand this with other artists too, like Lynette Yadam Bochi. She, similar way. I'm mm. pretty sure she uses a body, but it doesn't mean what the body meant. But for this one, I was like, well, why don't I try to think about how I remember this person specifically? And they were imposing, delightful, fun to be around, great person. Um, but it was hard to kind of identify like if we were in friendship or in partnership in any way. And it was something I was trying to navigate. So I was like, you know, you're standing on like this door that's like, so it's like you're kind of like rushing in. And then... Um, the portals are always for me just more so looking at like um, when you, like very literally like being in a predicament where you kind of need an exit like and I'm always like just trying to give these like ideas that you can always have what you like you can, you can have like what you need as far as eclipsing the space that you're in or the mental mentality that you're in or like eclipsing your feelings and maybe that's daydreaming in a way. Um, and it's also like looking at like the spirit and wondering like where they are and that they can be anything or where there is and there as a place could be anywhere. Um, but uh, also here there's like, there's always like sometimes I'm, I'm just speaking about what I desire. So like there's a, along the side of this painting, there's a like, that's like a um, curb and some gates at night and they're sparkly and the door is like off the hinge. And I think about like so many little things. Um, I'm kind of always remembering a, like that, this feeling of how good it felt to grow up and like to be a kid and to be at night. I was also like trying to make this street some form of a bird and this was the nape of its neck where the light hits mm -hmm. at the top there. So it was like this like thinking of a crane and like um, this vulnerable area of the neck, um, but also like I'm also always thinking about partnership. So I'm like, you know, you can drape my neck in something that's like kind and speaks to relationship. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted I was embraced, but I was protected, and that was the really the overall perspective of this work. Um, so I'm protected by the light, and I'm also protected by my own ritual. Mm. of desire and passion for myself, a red candle, and this is the remains of a black candle because I'm cutting ties often, um, naturally. I think we all should be, it's just healing. It's okay. And it's on a mirror to say that, you know, I've considered this and I'm reflecting. Um, yeah, so that, I, I was being a little literal with this work. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he said it too. He was like, what's up with this painting? <laughs> um, but that's not always the case. Sometimes I'm just... Um, reflecting a few different things at once uh, and they, they don't necessarily always relate. I am, uh, this is showing like a doctor's office on the left of this work and this like um, flower human is to me when there's a body that doesn't have detail it's like dealing with like the mythic or the uh, the fable or like a tale but like all those things could be true. Mm -hmm. um, and so like this person is here, speaking of like life sustenance, I'm HIV positive. And so, and um, you see like the pills coming down the steps. The pills also break the windows here. The, uh, and then this person is like um, sprinkling flowers. And I was just thinking a lot about life and like what sustains me. Um, there's a lamp here that is like personified as like a human kind of like, to me it felt like it was like belting or bellowing. And so it's, it's hard to see, but there's like metal above it. And um, it looks like it's dancing a bit. 
and these people, and it's a, to me, it's illuminating in a similar way that these bats or bird like things are coming out of this other ether. To me, it's like two windows in a way. Um, it's like illuminating what's behind, illuminating what's understood, what's been learned. And I don't know what, who these partners are, but yeah. I often show, um, I don't know what can be achieved through partnership. Maybe we all know a little bit about it in different ways, but I, then as I did grow up, seeing my grandparents in partnership, if I do reflect on why it feels so natural for me to always want to partner something, mm -hmm. is to somehow sustain its life. Um, and so, but I also felt like these two people weren't, um, these two like figures weren't necessarily happy or indifferent, they're just there. And I was like, for me, that felt like some kind of ephemeral relationship that like we don't have to like d define. Um, and then I'm interested in just like so many different like, I, I want you to f not be able to place yourself in the work. I want you to feel like it's outside, inside, that things are breaking. A lot of times it just starts as a perspective and not as like the image, like what a the image becomes is typically after I've decided a perspective. So I hmm. drew first, just I knew I wanted a wall to upend another part of some environment. And that's what I drew. And then I drew flowers because I found, um, you can't tell how much texture is here, but like this area is a found piece of a wall. So there's like um, drywall behind it. Mm -hmm. It's a, from a bathroom and there's tiles that I got from that. This is a found uh, uh, doorways, a molding side of a window. This was from another sculptural, Oh, this was actually from like a assemblage work and I, I just had in the studio. I don't throw anything away. I just keep using it until it's done. And fashion somehow plays into that for me where I'm like, it's a collection. So if you see the other parts of the door, it's like <laughs> the collection's done when the material's done because I'm not wasting. Um, big on that. But uh, yeah, so like, you know, the objects that I desire, the things that I desire the most, I grew up you know, not rich. So, uh, <laughs> and not like even, you know, somewhat middle class when you go to your grandparents' house. Um, so that left a lot of desire for me for a certain kind of housing, for a certain feeling of security through home. And I'm often like, re like grabbing this desire to feel secure. And so I grab mm -hmm. the things that we live in, you know. Mm -hmm. Um and how do objects speak to you? Because also mm -hmm. to know Devin is, and to be, well, when we were both living in Brooklyn, to be in community is, you know, scrolling through Instagram and people are always tagging Devin or would be Literally. like, if, if we saw like a dresser chairs. or like great chair, always <laughs> chairs or like, and then it would be really funny because, you know, someone would be like, I've got a truck or this. And like, can I get this over? Where's your studio now? And Literally. it's like, it was very charming to sort of see that kind of very, like everyone kind of knew that you were always scouring the neighborhood for things to make work out of. Um, but I am curious too, because I, I feel like the things that you find are showing up in the work very differently. And so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you're, you know, what are your thoughts on kind of your relationship to objects right now and found materials? Um, sometimes it's like, you know, it's like about majesty. So like, I felt like that headboard was this majestic. Mm -hmm. um, it's about like, like comedy or uh, rarity. So that mm -hmm. blue door is like this tall. And I, I was like, on a farm in Wasag, and I was like, please, can I have this door? <laughs> it's a small blue door. You don't see small blue doors. Give me this door. They were like, okay. Um, so, <laughs> sometimes it's purely aesthetic, like, but like also like emotional. Like when I see your iron gate, I'm like, you know, I could cry. I'm like, it's just so beautiful. It's so heavy and it's vulnerable. It's like it broke off of its, you know, uh, protection, mm -hmm. the thing that kept it safe. And, you know, I'll, I'll take it. Uh, and so, like, all, when I think about all that, I think of, again, through fashion. I'd be like, okay, I can aesthetically love this. And why do I aesthetically? The why is, like, what makes it more important. Mm -hmm. But, like, the first initial thing is, like, some very base dislike of it. Um, just, like, I like these shoes or I mm -hmm. like my socks and I like them. So, But then the why do you need um, starts to change things. So, like, oftentimes when I'm picking these objects up, uh, so it goes through eras too, but I'll tell, I'll tell you both both situations. Mm -hmm. The first is like the object is will never exist again. They don't make iron fences anymore. They don't make 
moldings like this. They're like so lightweight and weirdly made out of like chip, chip wood or MDF or whatever. MDF is bad. <sighs> Don't cut it without a mask. Um, so like, you know, the <clears throat> materiality won't exist again. Hmm. You can have it exist again. You could pay as much money as you would like for it to exist, but it will never do that again. Um, and also, I love when I can see four different or six different paint colors chip through the wood or something mm. like that. In Brooklyn, when I moved there 10 years ago, the expectation was for you to decorate your home. So every time someone moved out of an apartment, you got a pink one or a green one or this room's yellow. And the, no landlord spoke to you about, like, not altering that. Everyone, every landlord expected you to literally go into their apartment and do it out how you wanted it. Because that's what everybody did. Now, Brooklyn is gray Brooklyn. It's, <laughs> shit, there's probably some buildings around here that look like Brooklyn. It's, like, strange. It's, like, this terrible architectural wave going through the country of, like, cheap, crappy architecture, very dorm-like. I'm, like, are we just trying to create, like, college minds that never become, like, creative minds? Like... It's like, ugh, it's weird. So it feels like a dormitory, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think about that, that like we are, as we naturally have to, eclipse by generation, we eclipse, you know, a design era. Mm -hmm. They don't sell furniture where they used to sell furniture when I grew up. Um, I wish I had the furniture I grew up with. Uh, mm -hmm. I think in my family, the legacy of like those objects are most preciously um, protected through my grandmother. And then there's this other thing where I'm in a poem of words that just are in my head and they push me somewhere. So at first it was chairs. Like when we met each other, I was on chairs. And I think I was trying to find a place to sit, you know, like I was like literally trying to like place myself. Um, but I also wanted to consider things. So I kept thinking of like a couture salon and I made my living room. A mm -hmm. It was like mm -hmm. mirrors and chairs all around, no, no couches, just like chairs I found. So when I had that first show where I showed this work and um, de at um, company gallery, uh, we had this like public. So the, the, this thing happened where I put all thirty chairs that I had collected over the years, and I put them in the space, and then I gave them away, most of them. And there was this thing where uh, it created like a cafeteria-like experience in the center of the opening night. And I remember feeling like how public the center of the room was and how private the walls were. And mm. I felt exposed in very weird ways. Like I felt like insecure. I was like, do I know who to sit with? This is my opening. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, I love how that did that. So I was like the chairs, you know, over that accumulation period, no matter what they did in my house, they became this other performative object for everyone to socialize when they came to the show. Mm -hmm. um, and then I slowly but surely... I keep my gates. I love my gates. But I slowly but surely moved to doors. Mm -hmm. And doors have been able to me to answer a lot of questions, so much so that, you know, in that in the walkthrough, you see that one of them has a suit on. And it's become a thing where I'm starting to kind of create performative objects through them. Like, I cut one that hasn't been shown yet, but it's like I can lift it up and I can sit it back down the chair. Mm. And I've been thinking about doing body studies through the door. Um, and... I like to think that the reasons why I'm thinking of those things are for the most simple, simplest idea. Like, I need entry. At one point, I needed a seat. I needed somewhere to be. I needed mm -hmm. to be accepted within my space. And now I want entry into other spaces. But it's also helping me take photographs without imaging the people who mean the most to me and then selling them to whoever, because that's what happens. People mm -hmm. buy photographs of people's you know, sometimes photographers take uh, images of people who matter to them. And I want to reflect on my family, but I don't want to sell my family. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting way for me to, like, deal with the body mm -hmm. without dealing with uh, their body, literally. Mm hmm mm hmm mm hmm Wow. <laughs> Over that <laughs> month and a half, people would come up to me and they would be like, hey, you know you are an artist, right? And like, and they, and one guy had just helped me break through this like thing that I think a lot of young people do when they're starting to make things or trying to just define what they're doing. Um, but we make it so complicated and it's not. And he was just like, yeah, you know you can be an artist because you're interested in art or you can be an artist because you need to make money or you can be an artist because he's like, every day it's gonna shift and that's okay. And I was like, oh, then that, that makes sense. Okay, I'm an artist. And mm. then I got back, and that just was literally the start of my career. Um, 